Hi, my name is Todd Menadier. I'm the Director of Field Implementation and Enhancement for the New Jersey Green Program of Study. You're about to watch a session that takes place at Brookdale Community College. The participants are all alternate route uh, instructors from different areas across the state. The focus is not necessarily on how to implement the content of the projects themselves, but what is it to design a project and how do you actually implement a project in terms of what are you really focusing on for the students that are in your course. The green program of study uh, content area is very diverse and we all know that each district has its own abilities and therefore the focus on this particular session is for you to really learn about what kind of pedagogy and what kind of paradigm you need to have in order to design a, a project-based learning um, scenario such that the students are actually going to be engaged and they're also going to get those higher order learning skills such as the 21st century skills, things that they're gonna actually bring uh, with them no matter what career or what profession they get into. So as you watch this, I want you to try to take uh, a few things into mind. The, the first thing is think about what lessons you're going to um, utilize from the green program of study. And then think about how these methods can actually be applied to that particular lesson that you plan on implementing. And hopefully you'll come up with some questions and some ideas as you watch and as you see what the participants are learning as they go through the session as well. We need to really align around what is PBL. So before I pull in some of the direct questions that I want to go with this, does anybody have no idea what PBL is? So you all know what the P stands for? Project. What's that? You have no I idea? guess project-based learning, is that correct? Right. Oh, okay, I wasn't sure. <laughs> okay, so that's fine. That's fine if you don't know, that's great. We want to know where you're at and what we can bring to increase your awareness of this. So project-based learning, okay, is that in agreement there? Yeah? Okay, so by the end of today, we're going to realize that it's a bit more than just projects for that P. And hopefully you can actually recognize what we mean by that. So that P stands for something else besides projects. Projects, yes, but there's one more part to it that's very, very, very important. And you're going to have a quiz on this halfway through, so be ready for that. The first question then that I was, again, going to have you do in groups, but we'll do this together, is how does it differ from other more traditional methods? What do we mean by more traditional methods? By the book. By the book, right? So here's the textbook. Read chapter six, answer the questions at the end of the chapter. What else? What's another traditional method then? Lecture. Lecture, right? So you stand in front of the class and you just talk at them, right? So, so now how does, this, how does a project-based learning, how does that differ from those traditional areas? With, in what respect is that different? You can supply the direct information to what they're, I'm going to use the term constructing, developing. <laughs> okay, so the kids, Instruct and the kids are part of the development. Okay. So, and again, that's different where now you have the kids doing this, whereas in the traditional methods, the students, or the teachers rather, are the ones that are actually doing the instruction. Okay, what else? How else does it differ from other I think other it, it's traditions? more hands on, it's very practical. What do you mean by? Practical in what sense? Practical in the sense that they, they, they get to use their hand and they think they, they're more creative. You, you, you encourage them to, to add creativity to whatever they're doing. So you get more feedback. Wow, you're saying a lot of things here. <laughs> you get a lot of feedback from it. They're allowed to be creative, right? If you're using a textbook, there's limited creativity. If you're in a lecture, you're not really being creative because you're just absorbing materials. And you're not getting that much feedback in those senses because you're not engaged. You're not actively engaged with it. So you're doing some work that's practical, it's hands-on, and you're getting feedback and you're allowing to be creative with it. Right? So clearly those are ration reasons as to how it differs from those particular areas. This is where I, I, I lose it because where in here is the concept that we're, we're trying to have our students to understand? You know, I understand about hands-on. I, I need to know how to incorporate the concept because the work that I'm doing is not hands-on. For instance, I'm in business studies. Right. 
right? And I'm in finance and economics. So the question was, how does it differ, right? So in both cases, you're going to teach them the concepts. In one case, you're going to lecture to them, <clears throat> or you're going to give them the textbook, or you're going to be very traditional. In the other case, you're going to be involving the kids at a higher degree. You're going to make sure that they're more hands-on and active in the whole process. Hands-on doesn't mean that you're making something. Hands-on means that they're designing their own learning experience. Okay, all right. Practical in the sense that it's not a textbook, so at the end of the day, you're starting a business. Maybe you're not you know, answering questions in a business textbook. And you're, getting cr you're creative, you're starting your own business, you're coming up with your own ideas, and you're getting feedback in the form of input from the community, let's say, input from business folks, as opposed to a test score. Um, if I may. Sure, <laughs> of course you may. Todd, uh, right now, are you not doing lecturing? Are you not instructing? So aren't we supposed to be doing more of a hybrid type of thing where we're, for maybe 10 minutes, doing some sort of instruction and then giving it to the youngsters to apply, to analyze, to be creative with what they've just been modeled for? So by the end of the and day, you know, hopefully you have There has to be some <coughs> instruction where the teacher is saying, this is what you're going to be doing how we're going to be doing it. And you have to learn a little bit, maybe by reading from a textbook. Now apply what you've just learned. Does everybody agree with that? That the teacher should guide hybrid. them and say, this is what we're, going, we're supposed to be doing, and this is how you're supposed right. to be doing it? Here, enjoy yourself, learn. But, but see, but see, see. You see, have to but, have but, some but, sort of but see that, what, what, what he's saying, though, is, is, is that, yeah, I'm gonna tell them that the concept of economics impacts your life. I need them to own that concept and understand that concept and then explain to me or give me give me something or construct something that they can demonstrate that under, understand it based on their understanding. Say so that's the difference. Right? It's not and I, I can tell them what the concept is and make sure they understand it and then ask them to, to, to demonstrate how they understand it and then guide them, guide them through it. It's not, it's, it's a struggle to do it, I, you know, because I'm a lecturer. I, I you know, I, I want them to take notes and I want them to, 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 to be able to understand the reading and writing and interpreting and all of that stuff, but I need to move away from that to engage my, my students. Right. And by the end of today, you'll have hopefully a better understanding yeah, of that. Yeah, because yesterday we did the uh, curriculum, okay, and uh, the standards and everything, and it was all about writing, reading, and learning. Now we're in here and we're talking about the other part of this puzzle, and it's the project. So there has to be some reading and some writing and some instruction someplace, and then letting them go we'll out. Right into the project. And, Right, yeah. exactly. That's what we're to do. So this is the second part. What your constraints were, it seems like you're constrained by this idea that for project-based learning, there has to be some input first. So you have to lecture, you have to give something back, right? So you're constrained by this idea of students don't know what they don't know, so we have to give them something, right? So some of the concerns or the constraints that go along with that are how do we um, give some background information? Okay, and we'll, again, we're going to address that and we're going to see how to look at that and how to figure out ways to work that into a project. Any other concerns or constraints that you, you can envision if you've ever had uh, an experience with a project-based learning uh, lesson that you've done in the past or something that you might be thinking about, like maybe I can't do project-based learning because of this? Safety issues. Safety issues, right? That's always a big concern and that's a concern, again, whether it's project-based or not, that's probably a concern, but I think for project-based learning, it increases the concern with safety issues because you're giving a bit more autonomy because you're allowing the kids to be part of the instruction process. Keeping them on task? Staying on task. The biggest constraint I've come across is um, the time constraint, how um, class periods are limited, 
to um, you know, 40 minutes. So. so so time in terms of classes, OK? Does anybody have another time yeah, constraint? It's, it's almost like if I can get permission to, like, in a sense, have a, an, like almost like a field trip, but we're not going anywhere. We're going to just stay here. And we're going to work on this project, and we're going to focus on this all day. All day, yeah. And, and, and this way, there's no uh, <laughs> interruptions, and you know, we could get it done. Yeah. So, I know Frankie because I just took a position with the workshop school, the Sustainability Workshop School in Philadelphia, which is a workshop model. It's like that. And I know Essex is doing a very innovative program called the Teal Center, where the students there show up, and they're in a big room. No classrooms, no walls, no bells, nothing. What do you want to do today? We're here to guide you through that process. We have a checklist that says you need all these requirements to graduate. But if Aram does all those requirements in the first half of the year, Aram can work on a project of his choosing or go into an elective or do an internship. Right? So we're all at different paces, too. So the school day comes into an issue there. So a lot of places are actually looking to change that model of you have 40 minutes to do your work and then stop because your learning has to stop in 40 minutes, right? That makes total sense, doesn't it? No, right? We don't, we're, we don't learn that way. Um, my concern is a little different from some of the others. It's um, uh, materials. We don't, I, I work in a prison, so, you know, we don't have computers, um, internet access. Oh. Can't take them out. <laughs> Can't give them anything. No field trips. No field like, trips. Wow. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so that would be my, our biggest what do you, problem. What do you teach there? I teach cosmetology. Okay. Wow. Um, all right. That's an interesting. interesting. So they're Think allowed to use scissors and, and, and razors. Yes, they're but, allowed to use scissors, yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> the all rounded right. edge. The mm -hmm. ends, the rounded, are they? <laughs> the scissors. No. <laughs> so are there any other concerns, constraints that you've experienced or can foresee, okay. So, <clears throat> so one of the next questions is, um, if you've ever had it, and I think we kind of did some of these already when you were talking about it, some of the challenges that you've had as you've actually implemented it. So if you've had a project, what are some of the barriers that you've run into? What are some of the, the issues that you've had as a result of, of putting a project into practice? Practice beforehand. You never know exactly how long it's going to take. Right. So again, the time constraint comes into it again. You know, you, you usually go over, right? Mm -hmm. Almost always. I know projects that we had, we had pictures of students working and the sun is setting behind them. So it, it, it happens. Policies and uh, procedural uh, constraints. <laughs> always a big issue, right? How do we get around that? I don't know. Uh, that's, that's, that's never an easy point, but um, planning out around it might be helpful. So as you work through the design of yours, think, who do I need to ask permission to do this? And would it be easier to just ask for forgiveness? Hmm. Sometimes that's, that's my method. method. There you go. <laughs> so most teachers do, right? Todd? Yes. Educating administration to the new techniques. All right. That's a very big one, right? Making uh, ad admins aware of it. There's been a lot of controversy and talk about how is this going to look, um, or how is the new Danielson model, for example, how are evaluations going to look when you walk into a CTE classroom? That model is not the same, generally speaking, a CTE classroom is not the same model as an academic classroom. But you're being evaluated the same way with the same criteria, the same components to it. So in one sense, if you look at like the SGOs, I think it's a benefit for you because how many kids walk into your class and know how to weld or know how to be a carpenter or know how to cut hair, right? They're walking in and so your, your pre-assessment, they all get zeros. And their post-assessment, they all get, you know, hopefully a passing grade. So they went up a significant portion and everybody's happy. So that might be a benefit. But when an administrator works, walks into your classroom and they see one person doing one thing, another person doing something else, and somebody doing something entirely different, they might have an issue with that. So how do we make them aware of how to look at a project-based classroom, how to look at a real CTE classroom, and how to make them aware that, hey, we're still encouraging learning and our students are still engaged. It's just not that autonomous sit in, sit in rows and everybody do the same thing model. 
and the DOLs are going to be different, could be different for each individual student. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you, know, you, you know, and that, 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 that's tough. It because is. If, I, if I'm in a differentiated classroom and I'm, I have my students at different speeds, you know, and different capabilities, then, 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 then what, what they are demonstrating and what their learning is and what their objective is, is different. And I don't know how to address that in, in, in my lesson planning and to be able to demonstrate in on an observation. Right. Demonstrating an observation is harder. Integrating into a lesson plan for a project is fairly easy in that sense. Yeah, yeah. You find their power, you find their strength, you build in, and you promote that. It's okay if you are not on the same pace as everybody else. That's okay. That's perfectly fine. So what are some advantages of using PBL? Why would we use this instead of a traditional method? What do we get out of having a kid-centric, hands-on, practical, creative experience that gives them multiple uh, areas for feedback? What do we get out of that? Why would we want to use that? I think there's better opportunity to challenge all kids at all levels. So your high levels aren't bored, your low levels aren't shutting down and quitting. Um, you know, if they're geared, you know, at their own pace, um, you can just keep pushing them along and monitoring them to make sure that everyone's being challenged. Everyone's being challenged, everybody's helping out, so if a student is doing really well, they can help the struggling students, that's okay. It's not cheating in that case, whereas it might be if they were, say, taking a test, right? So, challenging to all students, engaging for a other. Encouraging. Encouraging. How so? How would this encourage you? How would doing something uh, like building this be more encouraging? Building self-esteem, building, um, yeah. Has anybody ever taken a, a number two pencil, made a whole bunch of circles, stood back, and said, wow, look at what I did? <laughs> Probably not, right? <laughs> Doesn't make sense. Maybe, maybe, right? But you, you, I don't think I've ever taken pride in taking a test. Maybe a little bit from getting the grade back, but there's been things that I've done that I was never even graded on, but the product was amazing, and I take more pride in that. So think about that and how that ties into project base and why you're going to do it and what you're going to get out of it, because encouraging students to succeed and encouraging them to take pride in their work and be a craftsman is something that we would want and to promote not just now, but it's also going to be useful when they step outside of the classroom. <clears throat> yes, yeah, I'm an HVAC uh, instructor, and as far as everything goes here, I agree with what I'm seeing as far as my program goes. And we do have a shop which is up to date with everything. Our whole school is pretty much up to date with every construction we have, and for that matter, academics, computers, and so forth. But with my case, I'm, I'm self employed also. I will pick out a couple of my students that I feel are ready if they do good in shop, hands on, and in the classroom, they'll work with me on the outside. So that comes together for me, which is a big advantage probably over, both, I'm sure, most people here. So now they see what was taught, what was lectured to them, what notes they took, what they seen on the smart board, what we did in the classroom and in the shop, now it comes into reality. And most are appreciative. And I still get uh, texts and emails from former students showing pictures of what they're doing. So it comes together. You know, it's probably an advantage that I have over most other instructors in this room. Yeah. Yeah. And why do you think they send you pictures? Well, they're proud of what they're doing. Proud I mean, they're making they're money. Yeah, right. I have a lot of yeah. couple guys in the union, I have a couple guys that broke away from the union, went on their own. They're self employed and they're doing quite well for themselves. Right. So when they send you a picture, right, they may be sending you something like, they're probably not asking you, hey, what do you think of this HVAC system? Or maybe they do ask you questions like, what is this? How do I fix I'm this? Asked questions I'm also, sure. yes. But for the most part, you know, they're really looking at it from the perspective of, look at what I did. I'm proud of this work. Thank you. Despite the fact that he's no longer his teacher and he's not grading them on it. So that's developed into the design of a project in the first place. Encouraging them to take pride, becoming their advocates. How can you advocate for somebody who is going to be an HVAC installer when all they've done is take a pen and pencil and paper test? Same with automotive. I don't want the person who got 100 on the, the Scantron sheet to fix my brakes. So, and it ties into reality. And one of my, one of my best implements is that 
it's happened a couple times a year it happens usually where I'll get a text from a former student he's in the area can I stop in so I have to call you know the guard house up allow him to come in and I said yes you can stop in but I want you five minutes in my classroom and you're gonna talk to them yep and, and that's it's, awesome it's a bingo I mean it works big time yeah where do you work Larry State County Tech okay so you work with uh um name it I, uh, I guess picture in my head right now but mustache bald guy was out for six months Welding shop, what shop is he, you know? HVAC. Joe, Joe, uh, Italiano. Joe Italiano, thank you. You go with the green technology? Yeah, yep. That's my also part, partner in business. Oh yeah? yeah nice. We were in the same, we, we do the same, so it works out very well. Yeah. So I was gonna say, because of the flexibility in the instruction, the teacher has a better advantage to evaluate every student. Because it's not just lecturing and getting a test back. Um, you're, you're moving around to all the different groups, talking to all the different students, finding out where they are with assessment as opposed to Everybody giving you something at one time. Authentic evaluation, which comes in with individualized evaluation, which comes in with practical evaluation, right? So as you look at me standing up here, you might be thinking, oh, this guy does this, or he does that, or he knows this, or he doesn't know that, or you're making assessments, you're evaluating me essentially, right? And it's happening as an ongoing process. It's not happening at a one-time standalone point. And if you want, if you see something happening in an authentic assessment, you can pause it, you can address it, and you can work through that, and then, or encourage it, depending on the situation, and then continually go on. Whereas it's difficult to do that in the more traditional senses, especially if you're just lecturing, how am I gonna know that I need to pause or that you need to stop and back up unless you really raise your hand and tell me that something needs to happen? I have a question. <clears throat> I'm also a vocational instructor. I teach carpentry in, in Somerset County. I think those of us that are, are, are trade instructors or uh, somebody said cosmetology, all of what we do is project-based. I mean, whether it's your hair or, or, or someone else's hair or those little model heads that they use. I don't know if you guys use those or not. But uh, we all do project-based instruction, and a lot of it is give them X amount of time of, of literal book instruction and then apply it go go to work put the tools on and go to work so I'm not sure I know this is a vocational or CTE group but I'm not sure who does what I know he's academic over there am I right you said business or, right. or right. yeah so but those of us that do do the shop work I get the kids two hours and 15 minutes and, and the time is fine that works out well minutes they took it away so he said CT is inherently project-based. Does anybody disagree with that? I do, as a supervisor. As you, a supervisor? 100% of the people in the vocational or CT classes are doing project-based with regard to the thing. But is it student-centered or is it teacher-centered? That's the difference. Project-based is student-centered. You provide, you provide a, a, an activity for the student and let them go at it and not say step one, step two, step three, step four, go out and do it. So that's what, that's what you have to evaluate. I think what you say is, is, is true and only once they get past a certain point and have those skills. Up till that time, they need to be guided. And then eventually they get it and then they know. You know, there's like a, it's like that bird flying out of a nest. Eventually they get enough hands-on skills where you can just tell them to go do something and they can do it. But that kid in his freshman or sophomore year they have to be shown repeatedly how to do things. And then Basically. after a while, then they get it and then they can go. You know what I mean? So it's not automatic no, no, that, no. you know, so it's only after a while that they, they get, they, I should say, uh, learn those skills, then they can go off on their own. So uh, that, that, that goes back like to this concern. You teach them how to use a variety of tools and then once they, met, once they know how to use different tools, now you can get creative and Correct. see what you come up with, you know, and not just uh, with, with you're you not going to tools. Just... Tools can also be not just literal tools, but also just your your understanding of different concepts. You know, oh, you understand this kind. Okay, that's one tool. Well, how to handle it, even how to handle the tool, and, and you know, utilize it that way. Right. So that goes back to one of the concerns. We need to give them background info. We have to provide some background info, right? So that's a big concern. I'm going to tell you that yes, of course you do. You can't just say, "Here's the chop saw. Go for it, kid." That's that's not realistic, right? But do you need to tell them, how do you teach them how to use that tool? What, under what circumstances? What questions are you asking? Or what directions are you giving? That's what we're going to come in through. So 
if it's project-based, right? Maybe it's entirely project-based. Maybe you have a lot of projects. But what we want to focus on, which is what, which is what Russ alluded to, was that learning side. It's PBL for a reason. There's an L at the end of it, right? We want to make sure that they're learning. And that concept of project-based learning is what we're going to kind of experience and then define as we go through this uh, process today. And hopefully, you'll have some strategies and some ideas as to how do you design for that and what do you keep in mind as you're implementing it. So what do you want to learn about project-based learning? I'm not going to write these down, just real quick. Anybody come here? Obviously, was anybody forced to come here? So you're all here on this beautiful <laughs> summer day on your own accord? <laughs> Excellent. Um, so you're probably signed up for this because you want to learn about project-based learning, I'm assuming. Makes sense. I don't think you come here for any other reason. So what did you want to learn? What did you want to get out of this from today? If, you know, I, uh, we already do projects. It's ongoing, et cetera. But I wanted to get a different slant because it, it seemed like that's what this was offering, that another viewpoint that maybe I'm not aware of. OK, excellent. That's really where I'm coming from. Hopefully we can help you. I wanted a better understanding so I can take the problem that I'm having now with the new policies and procedures, because now they want everything to be the academic classroom that's 45 minutes, and every 15 minutes the kids are all moving to a different activity. You know what I mean? How do I take the PBL and show that there's the structure and whatever so that it suffices the policies, but I still get to do <laughs> my projects. Right. So maybe just a better understanding so I can give the administration what they want so I can do it. I don't think I've seen an administration, Russ, tell me if I'm wrong, that kind of said, you're not following the rules, even though what you're doing is amazing and awesome. And I know Ron can attest to this. He's built some amazing projects and done some awesome cars. But he's not following the rules, so stop what you're doing, despite the fact that the kids are interested, engaged, learning, and having fun, and start doing it this way, where every 15 minutes you change pace, because that, with the bells, and the, the change of schedule, and the um, huddling everybody through the, the hallways from point to point, that's doing nothing but preparing them for a life in prison, because that's the only place that they're ever going to have that kind of serious but that academic is really where what this I'm, is the way it's going to work, this is what's going to happen. That is what again. I'm running into. Well, if I don't have that, de you know, the do now on the board, if I don't, you know what I mean? Like, it's this checklist. And if I don't have all these things, then I'm getting so checked off. So what I was saying, though, is if you would design a PBL where, to If engage, I could interrupt for just a for second, that. where do you work? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I'm going to say something, and I don't need to know where you work, but I will say this get out because it's just frustrating the hell out of you you know um, it sounds like from the way you describe it they are in some kind of lockstep on how they want things done there's a clash there between how they want things done and what you would like to do get out I can I can sympathize <laughs> I've, I've experienced you know some freedom but also some okay the minimum state oh the state's coming yeah. I know <laughs> boy it's this might a help challenge. it's I a challenge so a mixture again, of I don't think anybody's a mixture of, of this programming plus maybe looking at options you might be able to make it work yeah. one of the things that I'm I'm concerned about or I'd like to get out of here is that it's imperative that I partner with the project people in my academy. For instance, I'm teaching economics and finance. Uh, it's very, it, it's, in order for me to develop and to design a project that's meaningful to my, my students, I have to incorporate some of the culinary folks so that I can build my project around that. And that project is going to be, I don't care if the class is 40 minutes or 80 minutes. My class or my project and my learning is going to extend outside of the building. It has to. And if I'm not doing that, then I'm not really doing the student a justice. Right? Because they got to, they got to take beyond the, the four brick walls what Definitely. it is I'm learning, what they're learning. Definitely. So you know? 
So, so I, I, I understand the administrator's constraints. I understand why they're doing it. I got all of that, okay. But, but procedurally, I don't have the time to partner with the culinary people to set up a project that's meaningful, that I can, I can, I can let, uh, talk and create a project in my economics class that makes sense to them on a, on a culinary basis. That's what I need to learn how to do. And, and I think if I get a better understanding of the, of the PBL process, I can make it work. I can make it happen. I'm not sure if we could help you communicate with your culinary teacher, but we can. We do in, advise and, and ensure that anything is real life and integrated at as many areas as possible. Yeah. What I was looking to learn uh, were strategies on how to address the concerns, basically like the ones that we listed, and also um, to be made aware of um, reliable resources like organizations, blogs, books that uh, you know that I could refer to Great. for more ideas. Excellent. Have you heard of BIE? No. So BIE.org has um, a lot of resources. Some of the materials, I'll, I'll be sharing some rubrics with you later. Um, Bucks Institute. Uh, some of the materials that I'll be sharing with you later have been borrowed from there and adjusted accordingly. So you'll see that if you, if you look at the rubrics that I give you later and go on BIE.org and look at their rubrics, they're fairly similar. A lot of things were changed to accommodate more of a CTE approach, but it's a, it's a good, useful website to get a, a starting point off of. Aren't, we're getting PLCs jammed down our throat. Wouldn't that cover him? And I don't know if anybody else is, but you know, we just settled the contract and they took away some of our preps, or we, we agreed to let them have a couple preps, but in order to satisfy the state's need for PLCs, are, would that help you at all? Because that's exactly what you're talking about. We're so far from a contract, it's not <laughs> But that's also if the PLC is run appropriately. So it's one thing to say, yeah. do a PLC, and here's the time to do it. It's another thing to actually have a PLC that, that works. That works. Okay, yeah. Fair enough. So that's that's always a bit of a trick. Which now is do nice you teach to, these to classes to administrators? Culture, so, you got Russ here. Well, I, 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 <laughs> he's certainly a minority here, but uh, so a lot of the the program that I worked with opened up my eyes significantly. Between that, here's a teacher, here's an administrator, and there's a giant void between them and what is it that everybody really wants ultimately so the job of the supervisor is here's all the things that you have to do in a school and they have that checklist and they have all these laws and these legalities that they have to follow and the idea of a teacher is I don't want I don't think that anybody outside my classroom should tell me what to do and I know exactly what's right for my students and the reason why the laws exist is because there's some issue with we're not all producing super genius kids right so they have to create something that will effectively implement strategic thinking, strategic teaching, but there's no communication between the two as to what they want. So it was interesting for me to go from a meeting with a supervisor and then walk down the hall, have a meeting with the teacher and be like, your supervisor just said that. Like, you, you guys should talk more because you're on the same page, except they're boiled under, buried under paperwork and everything, and they have this checklist to do, and you can adjust those, and you can adjust this lesson, so there's the piece of the checklist that they need. It's right there, under your nose. You just have to make it clear for them. So working to develop more of the supervisor perspectives and educating the supervisors as to what good teaching looks like will be beneficial to everybody. And that's not something that we can do um, as professional development um, lecturers or, or providers. We really need people on the ground floor because every school culture is different. There's no one right way to solve that problem in all the schools. Any, anything else that you really, you don't want to leave here today unless you learn this? Um, I just wanted to learn how, how to implement PBLs in our school, in our school district. I am a supervisor, and I work young, I'm a supervisor as well, and I want to know how can I support my department chairs, my teachers, and also the board administrator implementing PBLs in our district. Excellent. Maybe so, see a model also once we're done. Okay. So we're about to experience a tiny piece of that since we only have so much time. Um, and then there's some things that as a supervisor 
you may want to pick up on and focus on, and then you could probably bring them back because we developed this. I come from a science and chemistry background, physics and power systems. Ron has a industrial design background. Frankie teaches Spanish and music, right? And everybody here teaches something different. So we're not doing this as here's project-based learning for this particular route. Here's project-based learning for everybody and in general. And what is it that we design for? What is it that we focus on? Which is the same no matter what you're learning or what you're teaching. So if you bring those ideas back to your school and build an understanding around those and maybe borrow pieces of the template, the rubric that we have, that'll be useful. So the activity that you're about to witness is actually two different activities. The participants don't actually know that they're engaging in two different activities. So there's only two groups that are, are going through a very directed, oriented um, process. In other words, they're given a very prescriptive scenario in which they're going to design different types of circuits by following set instructions. All of the background information, all of the content that they need to understand is actually given to them on the page right there. So the other groups are given what's known as a, an authentic design experience. This experience is much different in that it's prompted by a design challenge. So in this particular case, they're challenged to come up with either one of three different, a solution to either one of three different scenarios. One of the scenarios, for example, is that Terminal? I believe we have a picture here, right? So I believe this is our battery, that's the terminal. It still doesn't have three LEDs, all right? You're going to stay after in a second. So all the materials that are over there are for everybody to use. So think about what you need and what you would use it for before you start working on it over here. It has to meet these requirements, right? Okay. In order to meet these requirements, everything you need is on the back table there. So all the groups are using the same materials. Oh, okay. So at some point soon, you may want to okay. start thinking. So we actually thinking, physically have to build this? Oh, yeah. That's the minimal oh. amount of thing that you need to make. And it has to meet the requirements. Oh, okay. And it has to work out. Okay? Okay. So it needs to go in the battery box? That's what they Did you have it. pictures? You found yeah. it, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, so that was a white one, so. Oh, it looks like a, a battery. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. See, I just should have listened to my partner here. All right, let's see what you figure out. It has to turn on and off, too. Oh, Jesus. How are we going to get a switch? Let's see if there's a switch over there. We'll do the second part now. I'm just right. making notes. I think if you follow the instructions a little closer, then that might not happen. Yeah. Kind of thing, so. We had a problem. Yes. Visually looking at pictures. Okay, this one told me nothing. However, over here, it deceived us. Yes? Mm -hmm. At one point, we thought we had to do all of this activity without the box. Now, I'm saying box. Partner is saying not. So, we had to reconcile. And so, that's what you learn when you learn yeah, more teams. Uh -huh. If we took, this came from the power source, we strip out a little section right here, and take one of the LEDs and run it around. No, parallel, huh? Could I use you put this meter? In? Oh, yeah, you could use it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so the answer to this, what, what happens? Uh, the, the, they, they don't light up. It says do both 
LED light up? No. no. Is it positive or negative? Negative. Negative, like okay. So that's our negative end of the battery. Yeah. That's the positive end, right? So without going with colors, let's just say we have a negative and positive. So if I wanted to connect this battery to this battery, how would I do it? Why don't you have to have two or no? Yeah, we well, do? they were asking us to try the series circuit with switch and two bulbs. Yeah. So we did the steps, we think. But maybe we didn't wire it correctly the second time. So that well, could so have been part of the problem, too. Yeah, so what's nice is that you've separated. Yeah. So now if you could get this to work separately, so I guess the question then is, you could probably... Should it work? At well, some point, should we be able to I think that's work? the goal of, of the... Yeah. Well, it says why or why not. I'm, I'm thinking maybe the goal right, is well, it wasn't going to work. Well, what I'm saying is you've isolated it. So mm -hmm. now you have to find out why this one didn't work in there. Okay, we got a splice. Not yet. I'm a little slow. It's all right. See, if I get, you know, when you see this, and you get to make pot holders and keychains like you did when you were a kid. What's that? <laughs> it's a good practice when you come to senior citizens doing little crafts. I hope I'm not doing this. I'm hoping postal somewhere. Well, I, you know, I just came back from Myrtle. I took my, tr my third trip down to Myrtle last week. So I went to the projects and I had a tour of the projects just to get the feel of the living condition. Right. Oh, tape it off. Yeah, all right. Just tape it off, play it safe. I don't know if that would call it a shirt or not, but I don't think it's, you know. Mm. Wow, you guys did awesome. Oh, man, that's cool. Now we're going to do is get to the house. Look, you got to show the camera that thing. <laughs> What do you think? It like so obvious. You guys good? Are you ready to present, Sue? You went through all the questions at the end of it? Well, we're working on Oh, okay. questions at the end of it. Questions at the end of it. We have to write. All right, let's um, do me a favor. If all the groups can just finish up the last piece that they're doing, if they're just making a connection or doing whatever. So before we present, I just want to kind of stick to this three minutes because I know we're, we're trying to uh, fit everything in here. So you have questions at the end. As succinctly as possible, if you can answer those, that'd be great. Okay, if you don't know the answer or you're not quite sure, that's fine too. We'll, we'll kind of reflect on that after uh, everybody presents. So the first question that I have for you though, before we call the first group up here, is how many different activities were occurring? In other words, did everybody have the same handout? You said I yes? I don't think so. You don't think so? I don't think so. I don't Why not? Why don't different you think activities. so? Just looking, yeah, just looks looking. Different. I think they, yeah, their paper. Not what they accomplished, so their paper looks but different. the paper she's yeah. got. In her How hand. many people knew that they had something different? Well, Two groups. Suspected. Russ didn't know. Did you know? I wasn't no. paying attention. No, anymore. wasn't paying Focus. attention. Did you guys? They're still not paying attention. Did you guys know? Yeah, I looked around and I noticed it was different. So these two groups here had a clearly different project. They're going to present what they did. These two groups are going to present what they did first. Did all of you in these groups notice that everybody else had a different project? That they were doing something different than you? Not, not till the end. Not till the end? Well, yeah. And you guys noticed pretty quickly, right? So they knew. Some of you, because of the setup of the room and everything, looked over and were able to see them. Typically, we try to put them in the corner, and you can tell that the other groups don't see that there's another project going on. Aaron, why didn't you know that they were doing something else? I was focused on this. You were focused on your work, so focused that you didn't even notice that your poor classmates were doing something else. So focused that he didn't even notice what else was going on in the classroom. Imagine you can get your students to be so focused and engaged on what they're doing that even though I'm talking, they're still working. They're still trying to get things done. Or they're sitting here. What did you guys? What were you guys just talking about before I said time's up? 
Be honest. No, we were talking about uh, Traffic, learning and design. how kids respond to different things. Right. Were you talking about how to design your project, what you were doing? No. No. Right? No. In other words, the two groups, which are going to tell you what they did shortly, when they were done, had conversations about things entirely different than what they were learning about, stopped working, didn't really think about anything going on, doing something else with their project. Let's find out why. Can you tell us a little bit about your project and then present? We don't even actually, well, we can present a little bit of those answers at the end. Tell us what your project was. We were learning about circuits. We learned about parallel circuits and um, series circuits, of which neither one of us had even seen this stuff before. My comment was, that's why I have my <laughs> husband, because I, I, this is all foreign to me. Um, and the goal was to create um, a series circuit, which is a simpler circuit, uh, the electric, the current flows only one way. And then when we were done with that kind of basic circuit to create what we have here, we which is a parallel circuit, mm -hmm. um, and connect all these wires so that the two lights are green. If they were red, we had them backwards and some other things. Um, so where did you get the materials from? The bag. And where did you get the bag from? The teacher. So everything that you needed to do that was provided for you by the teacher? Yes. And how did you know what a series circuit was? Because it's the written the, word. The and definition <laughs> is in here. It's on there? Yes. And how do you know what a parallel circuit is? The definition is in here. And it's on there? And how do you know what an LED is? We looked at pictures and yes. followed instructions. <laughs> and there's a whole description of it on there, right? There is, yes. in the first okay. page, yep. Interesting. So now, what grade do you think you deserve for that? Passing. Uh, I'd say B, because at the very end we were a little, no, you don't think so? <laughs> Nobody's ever said less than an A. <laughs> really? I'd say a B. I, I was I, we, starting with we were, we were a little <laughs> lost on this, this whole piece here, how it had to slip through, and, and that was totally, even though we were reading it the directions, complex. we were reading the words, but we really were not comprehending that it had to sort of slip through. Okay. Um, so. But ultimately. Did we achieve what we had to achieve? Yes. So ultimately you got exactly what you was expected of you. Yes, that's true. And how was it expected of you? How do you know what was expected of you? Because the lights lit up and we answered the, the questions. The proof of the pudding is on yeah. the desk. All right, so <laughs> can I just show this to everybody yeah. so they can see? And I'll pass out a copy of this to everybody. This was their worksheet, okay? They had everything handed to them. They had pictures of everything. They had pictures of all the circuits. So they followed the pictures. Don't lie. No, no, I'm very visual. More than following the, the instructions. And in the end, it says, here's what you should end up with, with the picture and with the description of what it should be. The switch should turn the lights on and off, and it should have, they should both be green. Now, if I were to give this to them and say, here's exactly what's expected of you, and they handed back exactly, exactly what's expected of me, they probably would expect a pretty good grade, right? Rightfully so. That makes perfect sense. Now, what was your motivation to want to keep doing this? Um, it was an assignment. I'm saying it was an assignment. It was about the teacher told frustration, me to. frustration, and, frustration. And, and wanting to just get it done. Okay, uh, I just want to get it done. Maybe I want to get a grade. That's my motivation. The teacher told me to do it. Everybody else seems to be doing it. I should be doing it. Yeah. Whatever. It's right? the character of the person as well. I do not put it down until I finish it. Okay. So I wanted to see it. Just to get something yeah. done. Yeah. Not necessarily no. a circuit, not necessarily a light, not necessarily learn about a circuit, just to finish this, what was I, I was given an assignment, that was my job, and I was enjoying working collaboratively with my neighbor towards a common goal. Okay. And you guys? I found it frustrating. And uh, but but they did too, by the way. They were just I, nice. But, but, <laughs> I, but I relied relied on my partner, who had some some basis, and and we were able to answer the questions as we went through the work. Uh, understanding what a parallel circuit was, understanding that, and the, the big thing was is that I didn't know that an LED had a positive and a negative side to it, and uh, so. I, we, we learned that, and once we understood that, we were able to use in a series circuit parallel 
concept because we, we were able to, to use the wire between the one bulb and the other bulb and understand the flow of electricity and how we reverse the flow of electricity by using that connection of those two wires. So I, it was, and then, and then now, see, it helped me to understand how I can use that for the things that I actually do to establish some economic concepts that I might want to incorporate and, and um, relate it to some of the stuff that we'll be doing in culinary, you know. Okay. Um, so the idea, again, and keep this in mind as we go forward, please, how do we design for this? What is this designed to get? Remember, and we'll get into the design part in the afternoon, but why do you think you would get a good grade? What do, do you guys think that you would deserve a good grade on this? Definitely. Definitely, uh, probably B. Why do you think that you would get a good grade? Because the only thing that we didn't understand because we didn't know is that the LED, is at a, it has a certain rating, like a 50-watt bulb or 100-watt bulb, and there is a voltage drop between each connection. And one, one, one of the LED would not light up. And I was saying, why, did, why is that light up? It's, it's connected perfectly. So that is one thing I didn't understand. But if I tested it using a tester, I'd have noticed it's the difference in terms of the voltage up, which I didn't do. OK. But so you took it to the next level. You did ask that question. But in, essentially, they told you that it wouldn't light up on here. It did. So, so everything here said, OK, you can stop doing it and, and therefore move on, basically. And it also said, here's what your final product should look like, and therefore you think that you get a good grade. Why do you think you get a good grade, though? Why would you get a B? What did you accomplish that gives you a B? The, con the major concepts of understanding the series and, uh, and parallel circuit. And where did you find that information out? Where? How, why? Because of the understanding of the flow of the electricity and the results that we got. From the mistakes that we made, yeah, and and un yeah. a little bit of trial, trial and error, right? Yeah. Which you wouldn't have had to do if you followed the instructions. Oh, the, the questions and everything is handed to you right here. <laughs> what a series circuit is, is it says what a series circuit is. What a parallel circuit is, it says what a parallel circuit is. Okay, if that's what I'm designing my project for, here's exactly what I want you to know, and how I want you to know it. Then yes, this is good and you accomplished it. You know what a series circuit is, you know what a parallel circuit is, you applied it, you did a little trial, trial and error, and there you go. Decent, right? Let's find out what the other group did and figure out what's better and what works more and why it would be important to design for something different than simple content. This, by the way, was taken, and I obviously used the materials that I had and took pictures of it. This was taken from the website of an electrical company to promote educating students about circuits. Step-by-step -step guide on how to make circuits, right? So let's look at what the other group did and find out a little bit about their process and their outcomes. So who wants to actually just share what they had, what that looked like for the other two groups that didn't have that design challenge? Want to talk about it? OK, sure. Um, with us, we had three options, three scenarios to choose from. We chose the third one, which states, you were shaken up by a recent storm that knocked out your power, and your simple handheld flashlight will not allow you to work in the dark on a problem that requires both hands. And so uh, what came to mind. Hold on, before you get to explain okay. your own thing. So they had three scenarios. You choose a scenario. The problem is that you, have, you need light, and you can't use your hands to hold the flashlight, OK? And you're also. The real problem is, is that you're a broke student, you don't have any money, so you have to use the pieces that you could find around your house. So how do you solve this with what you have on hand? Okay? And then there were five requirements that you had to follow as you went through that. And you had to justify why you, what you learned from those requirements and how your final product meets those requirements. Can you read the requirements real quick? Uh, yes. The, requirement, um, the requirements were for it to be able to turn on and off, use at least three LEDs, uh, have it wired as a parallel circuit, must be powered by at least 2.5 volt, 2.4 volts, and no open wire connections or short, short circuiting. Okay, so 
in this particular example, you only see parallel, the word parallel show up once, whereas in the other one, it shows up about six or seven times. Okay? And it actually defines parallel circuit for you. So in the back there, you had no idea. Uh, did you know what a battery or a wire was before you started today? <laughs> She almost actually solved it from the very beginning. What were you going to do? Wouldn't let us. I was going to use my cell phone. She was just going to use her cell phone. I was actually trying to figure out, well, wait, that might actually work, because it's more than 2.4 volts. You could use it hands-free. It fits the requirements, except it doesn't have three LEDs, yeah. at least not that I know. No, it doesn't. Research Maybe that, too. Some of them do. So what did you do when you didn't know? You saw this word parallel circuit, and you said, I know that parallel means lines that never intersect, but what did you do to find out that information? What a parallel circuit was? Google. Google it with your phone, right? Yeah. How many people would allow their students to use their phone to answer a question? I would. How many people are vehemently against that? Yes, because I would get written up. Because you would get written up. I got yelled at <laughs> in my school, not by, my, not by Russ, but by a, a, a coworker, actually, who ratted on me because I was letting my students use their cell phones in class. I was promoting the use of cell phones in class. And I said, wait a second, we have Dell laptops that were bought six years ago, or Dell uh, PCs, actually, that were bought six years ago. We're waiting for our new laptops to come in. Their smartphones have a stronger microprocessor in them than these computers, which take 20 minutes to boot up. And if they work, then we have to still wait for the internet connection that's very slow to come through. And then maybe we have an answer about 15 to 20 minutes later. And by that time, we're half asleep and forgot what the question was. Or they could pull their phone out, and in 10 seconds, they could have the answer to it. I like to be efficient. I also like to be economically efficient. Stop buying them fancy gadgets and toys and everything and desktop computers that they're not going to use and let them use their phones instead of whatever. You know, so it works out very, very well for them. That's what they're used to. That's what they do. That's what we're used to. That's what the real world requires of them. Let them use their cell phones. I would take his advice. <laughs> um, where, where we'll, we'll all, you Russ, you hired? <laughs> being taped. We'll be good. Yeah. This is being taped. No, okay. no evidence on okay, film here. Um, all right, so let's see what your projects came out to be, what you did during that process, and why you think they're so great. So any volunteers to start off? And you should have the, the answers to some of those questions at the end, too, during your presentation. Want to go? Sure. We okay. um, decided that in, in, in our uh, presented scenarios that we were going to go to the rave party. And, uh, <laughs> Naturally. <laughs> and we needed a, uh, the most impressive theme-related attire. So we decided to bling out a bow tie. And uh, so we took uh, five LEDs, which was a requirement of a minimum of three. Three. Yep. So we, we, we exceeded. We ex not only met, but exceeded the demands of the uh, exceeded expectations. The car expectations. Can you just show that to the camera, too, actually? We, we, that's we, really we, cool. we, we wired it in parallel, uh, which means that the, uh, I guess in layman's terms, the electricity flows to the light and past the light at the same time. Uh, <clears throat> The other, the other uh, requirement was that, uh, I apologize, let me find it on the sheet here. All over here, okay, I apologize. This, uh, how do we turn it off? Well, we, we, in absence of a switch, we decided to go with just a manual on-off, which would just mean pull the wire out from the battery. Okay, so that's how we can turn it on and off. Um, it was wired as a parallel circuit. We, uh, when we <clears throat> measured and found that the two batteries together gave us approximately three volts which met the uh, met the uh, 2.4 volt minimum um, down below I see it asked me uh, what would we most like to have had and I think a switch would have been handy we could have thrown a switch into this circuit it would have been nice and then getting down to the uh, last but not least on the back page what are some of the things that you uh, didn't know before you started how did you find the information? Well, together, collaboratively, we were able to come up with most of the information, um, whether it be what a uh, parallel circuit was, and uh, the polarity you know, of the um, polarity of the, the LEDs. Exactly. The polarity. Did you know? You, you knew the negative okay, so and the positive that. on a nine volt feed, and we you would, and uh, <laughs> um, combined with the tools that we had, and I have a little pocket knife on me, we were able to put this together. And, 
not relative ease, but it was uh, not too demanding. Um, so the team together is what made this easy to do. And uh, fun. And fun. Yeah. Right. Really Whatever interest you're about the process. Without prior knowledge of parallel circuits and without the information that these people had, it would have been very, very difficult. Okay. Uh, luckily, our background knowledge right. helped out quite a bit. And so there they have the background knowledge. Other groups didn't have the background knowledge. So what do you think would happen in that kind of situation? Where you have a class of students that don't have the background knowledge, they have this design challenge, everybody's like, I don't know what parallel is, I looked it up on my phone, and right. all I can do is right. follow some Chaos pictures. What happens then? Frustration. Mm. No, I, I, they just. And how do you bring them back before you lose them? <laughs> Is that a teachable question. moment? Yeah, lights on, lights on. Then you teach it. That's when you do it, right? That's when you actually sit down and say, anybody that's struggling, and you guys weren't struggling, you knew it. I'm not going to waste their time. Anybody that's struggling and doesn't understand that constraint about parallel circuits, come on over here. Let's all work together to figure this out, and we'll learn parallel circuits. Right? Now, here's what just happened in that case. Those three guys didn't waste their time. I didn't lose them. They're still going forward. And everybody else is getting all the information that they need to be successful and still wants to go forward from it, right? Now, again, that's different than making sure that everybody's on the same page. That's differentiation. That's formative assessment. That's looking at your students and figuring out who needs what, when, where, why, and how. And I may need to break that group down even farther. OK, you guys got it? You guys need some more help? Let's go. We'll still work with them. And that's fine. So they reached, all of their, they reached all of their goals. They had all their constraints. Look at what they came up with. Is that the same as anybody else's here? No. No, right? Is, is that something that you would use 100%, go to the prom or the rave party, the prom rave, with that particular item? Why not? I would go with a different color, probably. Different color, right? <laughs> and bigger. And bigger, yeah. right? So there are still some things more to Maybe a little yeah. flashing. But now, since it's creativity from the beginning, something that we never did before, obviously, you would learn from this and perfect it and move on with it. It's, if you design something for the first time, you're always going to be perfection going down the road for various reasons. And that's where you're going to start thinking a little bit deeper, outside the box, per se, but you want to make it better. Exactly. Everybody hear what he just said? No. He wants to keep going. He could keep going with that. Whereas I define the end point here. I said, you see this circuit? That's when you stop. And they stopped. And they talked about learning. And they talked about other things entirely. They have no motivation to continue to go on. There's always room for improvement if it's an open-ended project. If it's not an open-ended project, they're going to stop once you told them to, once they reach that defined point of done. If I, in my world, there's no such thing as done. In your world, there's no such thing as done. Imagine Apple said, we're done. We got the TI, whatever that first computer was called. What was that called? I don't know. But imagine they just said, that's the first desktop. Yeah, the Macintosh, like whatever, 1982. That's the first desktop computer. Guess what? We're done. Imagine they stopped, right? They didn't have anything from there. We wouldn't have laptops. We probably wouldn't have cell phones. We wouldn't have a lot of money. We wouldn't have Silicon Valley, all that fun stuff. Well, yes, but when we were finished, what did we do? We stopped. We stopped. Well, actually, we answered the questions. We answered the questions. Prepare for the remainder right. of the lesson. My point was to make it better. And, and that goes in more into your intrinsic motivation. For you, this is trivial. You've done something. You, not, you understood a lot of this, right? For students, it's still going to be novel and new, so they're still going to want to learn more. And this is a step in a bigger project, which we'll talk about at the end. This, this leads to further collaboration, too, now. They're showing that. Now, I can say, well, did you think about this? Did you think about that from a larger group? Now you're pulling everybody in together to do it at time permitting, of course. Um, but that was a small group that worked together. And now they're presenting it to a larger group, and then we can all participate in the same project they had, and that's going to happen for each one of us also. Yep. So with the group that finishes early, we'll call it that, okay, questions are done, and now they're talking about football or whatever they're talking about, and then the group that's halfway through and you're helping to assist, do you just let them talk? 
do you have challenge exercises and give them more bulbs so they can, you know, build well, a bigger mousetrap? What about the ones that, that never finish? That's where I would throw at them. <laughs> they have homework? I'll go back to what I said originally. I would throw that at them. Okay, what did you do? Why did you do it this way? What could have been better? You know, if you go through a safety thing or efficiency thing or whatever it does, whatever it costs, how can you make it better and improve upon it? Yeah. That's where I'm always, that's where I would always be at. And that's why I asked him too, like, what would you do? Would you actually wear this to a prom, right? A Let's summer. take a look at this. Right now it's Gordy. I'm gonna wear this, all this tape sitting around, not to mention, I'm gonna, what am I gonna do with this? If this. Oh, we talking inside the right? shirt. <laughs> if it rains. Does it reach inside the shirt? Yes, depends on the shirt. In my the, pocket's the on the pocket. other side. <laughs> right, so my pocket's on the other side, so we need to change that. Plus, so maybe a different color. Maybe a hat. little bit nicer looking. Maybe make it out of wood, since you guys are carpenters. <laughs> Every new every, every car's right. for sale, always new so and improved, right? It's a prototype. It's every, everything's new and improved. You can always do it. Oh, and that, that comes into the idea of, well, well, we'll talk about that afterwards, but we'll see. After we look at everybody's, right, you're going to start getting other ideas because not everybody did the same thing. So you guys might take a look at theirs and be like, wow, I like the way they made their switch or I like the way they connected it to this. I want to do that now. Now, since you guys didn't technically have a real switch per se, you were just pulling the wire in and out, whereas some of the other switches were a little bit more innovative, you might be like, you know what, I want to take that and put it in my design. And can you? Of course. People steal things from people all the time. Or borrow. So, next presenter, anybody? We'll go. go ahead. Well, we're your typical level one students in a level two class. No. <laughs> we came in We're knowing, um, answering the question, what are some things you didn't know before you started and how did you learn them? We didn't know a thing about what it was that we were supposed to be doing, so we started with the research on the phone and um, by asking questions to uh, the instructors, we found out a little bit more information. We chose the scenario, uh, we did basically what they did. The rave. Only we made a rave stick. Um, yes. A and our stick. rave stick is it, motion activated. You have to yes, it's motion activated. We um, were in the process of uh, trying to stabilize some of the LEDs when we were told to stop, but on a, um, on a very primitive level, this will work, and we can add to it, make it better. Now that we know the concept of parallel. We did use um, parallel circuit for the LEDs and the, what was the other one, Sequ sequence? No. Series. Series on the bottom for the batteries. And uh, we fashioned this cute little tube to hold the battery so it could be a handheld device and we can activate it as we're dancing and fist pumping and you want to show them how that yeah. works? <laughs> I mean, well, we're you still working on the light it? switch. Yes, we have to stabilize those other two currents. Nice. So as we press each side, it will go on and off. So I think you guys learned probably the most. I don't know. I, I started with them, so I knew that they were, they, they didn't know that much about electricity or switches or wires or that much at all. So I watched them progress. What happened when you were trying to learn this? What was I doing? Uh, no, you I mean, we're asking you, questions that would lead us to the next level. Right. So I didn't say, here's what, is, here's what a parallel You provoked is. us to research more on our own, too. Okay. So that is a powerful method, which I'm sure a lot of us do. But I, I want to emphasize that, that that's something that's really useful in doing more. Because sometimes we're just like, all right, you got five minutes, you know, here's a switch, or here's a, here's a parallel circuit, or this is what this is. And we tell them right away. And by us telling them right away, it's not ingrained in them. If they're asking the question, they want the answer. So if you're asking a question that's going to help them solve their bigger question of how do I make this all come together, they're going to go out and they're going to really ensure that they're more involved, more engaged, and more interested in learning it. And sometimes they don't even know that they're learning. Right? What, was, what did you think you were doing? Trying to build a rave stick. Trying to build a rave stick, right? What did you guys think you were doing? You, right, the front group. Um, oh, us. We were trying to learn 
how to connect these how to make positives and negatives yeah, and right? come up yeah. with positive and negatives uh -huh. turn some lights on follow the instructions <laughs> that's what we were trying to learn they were having a rave i'd rather go to a rave than that you know, yeah so. i agree so you see the difference motivation engagement interest students are actually wanting to learn a little bit different than what happens with other groups that were following instructions do you guys want to go tell us about your light hat uh, so to comply with the uh, constraints or the specifications that we were given, we went with uh, designing an LED hat. This way, uh, gotta model it. Uh, this way, it'll be hands-free. I don't know if you want to model the. It was too big. No, no, I adjusted it. <laughs> oh, you did? Yeah. It'll look good on you. And you know, in the dark, red light is actually. Uh, Nice. Frankie loves hats. This is the first time I've seen him without a hat. So you want to put that on? I don't know if it'll fit, but I'll try. So that's pretty sweet. So, so that meets your requirements, right? Currently only available in mascot white. I mean, Masking that's all right. tape white. After the fact, we figured out there could have been other designs. We could, it didn't even have to be a hat. I mean, after the fact, it could have been much more simple by just something that you could clip onto your shirt or something. Um, was, yeah. Um, but uh, some of the things that we came across were, uh, for example, like another group mentioned earlier, the, the, the whole idea of um, polarity with the positive and the negative with the LED bulbs. I didn't know that it mattered, and now we know that it does. Um, you know, like by having a parallel circuit, if one bulb were to burn out, the other two will still work, versus if it was set up in a series, then if one goes out, the rest of them go off as well. Um, another uh, another idea that came up while we were working together as a team is that I would have an idea, we'd go with it, but then she'd come up with an even better idea, like as far as with the design. And so I found that interesting in the sense that, um, like, it's, it's good when you think you have a good idea, but then someone comes up with a better one. It's like, oh, wow, cool, I learned something because um, it just it shows that working in teams you know, does have his advantages. And can't think you know it all all the time. So. <laughs> you hear that? You hear that, Frankie? <laughs> can't think you know it all the time. <laughs> He's my new colleague, so. You guys want to guess? Sure. All right, we picked uh, scenario two, which was uh, a small light for a party. Um, actually, we started out with the rave idea, but uh, well, realize we out realize that you're not wearing you this. Wear. <laughs> <laughs> you could wear it as an earring or something. <laughs> so we go. made this small light. Um, everything is buried inside. It's a little sloppy in there, but it does work. <laughs> we had a little trouble with the switch idea, but we got some help from the instructor on some ideas on how to make the switch. So we used two magnets. Actually, you only needed one uh, to complete the circuit. Uh, we do have one or two lights that aren't working probably because we just didn't connect them up real well and um, a regular switch would have been much easier we wouldn't have had to figure that out but uh, a little ingenuity and we made that work um, it meets all the requirements the on off switch three LEDs at least we have four actually there's five because there's one buried in there that that one wasn't working either which we had uh, reversed and was uh, smoking a little bit so we had to disconnect that real quick. Oh, yeah. Be um, it was pretty much fun, and it was good to work together. And uh, probably uh, for a grade, we think maybe a B because the lights don't all work. Does it meet all the requirements without those lights working? Though? You said you had three that work and one or two that don't? Yeah, two that don't. Okay. There's five. Well, one, one, one is working, very, but it's very, very dim. dim. It's very, very <laughs> dim, but it does It work. might just be the type, actually, because yeah. there's, there's a bunch of different types. How and do you, we also use two different color lights. How do you know that it's 2.4 volts? I actually used the meter and tested it. Okay. And if you look on the battery, the battery says 1.5. If you use two of them, it's at least three. Is it? And we use two batteries. Okay, so we talked about that. So that'd be another. That see, as a teacher, I would look at that and say, okay, a lot of people said that if I have two batteries and they're 1.5 volts each, if I connect them together, then I have what? 
batteries. Three volts. Three. That's what Actually, a lot of people say, Actually, it came out right? to 3.2 when I tested right? it. Right. Yeah, because they're brand new batteries. Mm -hmm. cause, um, that's not always the case, though. So now I would recognize that and be like, OK, from what I know about how to connect batteries, I can now say I can connect 500 batteries, 1.5 volts each, and I can get 1.5 volts. That's a fact. You can do that. So I would demonstrate how to actually do that. Or I would challenge you to do that. I would say, take these two batteries, connect them in such a way that you now have 1.5 volts coming out of it. Anybody know how they would do that? Parallel circuit. Parallel, exactly. Right? Parallel keeps the same voltage throughout. So instead of taking a positive to negative like they were in those battery boxes or like most people connected them, you would put positive to positive and negative to negative, and then the leads coming off of that would also be 1.5 volts. Okay, so that's another teachable moment that you would see as it goes through. So you're picking up on what they don't know and what they do know. Just, so, like, just like when you're given a jump start, jump start for a car, and the person that jump start when the battery dies, and that's how you connect it in parallel. Right. To help out. Or you can say if you have a diesel vehicle, you have two batteries in the vehicle, and they're going to be the same way, positive, positive, negative, negative. Yes, I could run. If you, well, they definitely have two batteries I know yeah. of. I mean, I don't, I don't have a diesel vehicle, but there's two 12s. Okay. That's, so the That's to maintain 12. At the final end of it, you still have to have the 12 volts, yeah, not right. 24. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Parallel. Um, so, last group, right? Yeah? And then I'll point out a couple things on here. Okay, we, we chose number three, which is provide a light source that's hands-free. And we started out by providing a, a little base here with using clips available to us at the bottom so it would stand up and allow it to work. Um, we, we didn't know a lot when we started. We, probably st we learned quite a bit as we went through. Uh, we, um, we're, we got involved with trying to get one LED to light um, we used a voltmeter to figure out how to get the, the proper voltage, things like that. So we learned a little bit about that. Um, I think probably what, most of our problem was time management. We spent a lot of time trying to get things to light and then trying to figure out how to put it together after was that we wasted a lot of time in the beginning. So um, let's take a look at that. Some of the things we didn't know about until we were coached, and then that helped out a little bit. Um, I knew initially that we had to do a lot of research, never thought about using the phone. I said, I wish I had a computer available to me. I could do that. Never thought about the phone. Uh, which is quite obvious now, but that wasted a lot of our time too. What do we know about this? How are we going to figure out that? Um, if we had this, we could do that, and in fact, we had it available to us. And it's also one of those things, it's like, well, if I take my phone out and start using it, are other people in here that are colleagues and professionals, are they going to think that I'm texting somebody or looking at Facebook or something? So you have that kind of mentality of what's going on. She's smiling back there with her phone in her hand. She's like, so. You know, that's fine. And, and somebody mentioned this earlier. How do we want to make sure that everybody's on task, right? And as I said that, I looked around, and she's on her phone, she's on her phone, she's on her phone, and I don't know if that was your phone or whatever. We're naturally going to do what we want to do when we want to do it. Why do we expect our students to just do exactly what we think they should do, exactly when they think they should do it, we, we think they should do it, and exactly how they think they should do it? If you want to go on Facebook and waste your time and not learn this valuable experience that I'm about to do, that's fine. If you want to spend five minutes off topic, fine. At some point, here's your requirement, here's your specifications, and here's what has to get done. If you're proud of your work when you're done with it, awesome. If you're not proud of your work, what does that say about you? Right? If you finish that and kids go on their cell phone, that's my fault. Because I didn't design that so that way students were more engaged. If students are on their cell phone during the other design projects, that's the student's fault. That's on them. They're not engaged to the level that they should be for creativity and for wanting to go forward and to wanting to work collaboratively. Okay. Um, what grade did you think you should get back there, Russ? I don't know. I, I, first of all, that's what I was going to ask you about assessment. Um, would there have been a rubric for this to, that I could judge? Yeah. So that, I would have probably looked at it. I would, I would have liked to have known the rubric and example. If you, if you complete this step, you get an A. If you complete this step, B, C, like that. Okay. I would have tried to achieve an A, but then after I didn't, I would be able to look at the rubric and say, well, here's where I went based on the rubric, and this is what I think I should deserve. And what do you think would be, what do you want to see in that rubric? Um, 
I guess it's different steps of completion maybe for this particular project. Um, if you get it to light, you get this. If you get it to light in parallel, that. If you use this, if you used all five requirements, A. If you used only three, B. I mean, you know, very generally, something like that, I guess. Okay. But I, I think I would like to know going into it what, how I was going to be evaluated, and then if I knew that, I could give myself a, a real evaluation if I could compare it against something. That would be just my opinion. So he brought up an excellent point, which mimicked what they said, well, about the evaluation. We think we should get this grade because we had three out of the four lights laid up. What grade do you think you should get? Meet all the requirements? Yeah. Meet all the requirements? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I say we are in the so look at what we just did. All right. We took this concept of making a circuit, putting it together, and some way, somehow, it had to reach, meet one of these scenarios. This meets most of the requirements. This is a pen. It has multiple functions. It can write on paper, just like any pen can. This is a stylus, so I could use it on a tablet. And on the back, it has an LED light, only one. So that's the only requirement it doesn't meet. Maybe it's not 2.4 volts either. It clips onto things, multifunctional, pretty sleek and cool looking. This is a product. That's a product, that's a product, that's a product, that's a product. Judging by the product alone, which one, including this, do you think is the best? Which one would you buy from a store? My pen, right? Now is the purpose, did I design this lesson that you just went through for, so that way you guys can make an LED product, a product that has three LEDs, 2.4 volts, and turns on and off and all the other requirements? Was the purpose of that to create a product? Yes. So, or project? No. It wasn't. And you shouldn't of... want to grade on that product alone. No, alone. Alone. <clears throat> Part of it, maybe. But in the process, the group back there that I worked with, working with them and watching them learn and watching them collaborate and seeing them overcome frustration, in other words, being adaptable, being flexible, they would get points for that group over there that didn't really finish but still had a very good collaborative effort, still communicated very well, still worked together, recognized the fact that they need to work on their time management, they would get credit for that. So what do you think that P in PBL stands for besides just project? Process and progress, right? Process. It is a process that you went through. So when, when you want a rubric in, in advance, you're going to get a rubric, and it's going to have very little in terms of what defines the product. What are we looking for? We're looking for creativity. We're looking for critical thinkers. We're looking for you to take the initiative to go out and research information. And when you find that information, you don't just go to Wikipedia and fix, fix the first image that you find and go with that. You research real information. And if that's the thing that we're looking for, then those are the things that you're going to spend a little bit more time on instead of making something that nobody's ever going to buy. Right? So how do we design for that? That's the next thing. So before we go to the discussion part, would you consider your activity to be project-based learning? Why or why not? Start with you guys. Um, definitely, because I think it definitely achieved the the goal of understanding how a circuit works. Um, it was a collaborative effort. It was collaborative. Critical thinking was definitely involved. Definitely there, <laughs> overcoming frustration. Really I mean, well, right. yes, there so was let's critical. Let's rewind a second. Right. There. If you follow the instructions, and I don't want to throw you under the bus, but the instructions, there's one part in there. It's a little tricky. The last part. But if you follow the instructions closely, mm -hmm. not just looking at the pictures, then it's, it's a fairly straightforward thing. And when you get to that last circuit and you have that circuit that works, <laughs> when it does work, you are graded on how well you followed the instructions. Yeah, you might have learned a little bit about oh, series because you saying. read okay. it right there. You okay. might have learned a little bit about parallel because you read it right there, and about LEDs because you read it right there. So in other words, if we want our students to learn something, they learned how to be good students. They learned how to follow the instructions, how to look at the pictures, how to get the job done. We want our students to learn more than to be good students. We want them to learn how to work together, 
We want them to learn how to be creative. We want them to learn how to figure out and problems, how to find information, how to troubleshoot, because guess what? When they walk out of the classroom, they're going to have to do all of those things, or most of them, on a daily basis. They're never going to have to put a wired series circuit together, a parallel circuit together. They're never going to have to put three LEDs on something and make it dangle above their head for a rave party. But they're going to have to do all those other things. So we design for those other things and incorporate some of those elements of the content into it. So project, yes. Maybe it was a project. You followed instructions. You got that. But the learning aspect of it was minimized by the fact that you were handed everything. If you're handed everything and you're not left to do anything on your own, how much are you really learning as opposed to how much are you just doing what you were told to do, okay. which is what you said yeah. your motivation right. was. Right. right. So let's design to learn. So the project-based learning component. And there are aspects of the other one that aren't really like that. So was the other one project-based learning? What could be improved? What can be changed? I think ours was project-based learning. We had to, the process of a project and the research we had to do to learn some of the requirements that were asked of us in regards to the parallel circuits, you know, the difference between that and the series circuits. We had to research that. And now we now know. Even with the leads, we didn't understand what no leads were for our circuits to work, for our um, lights to work. So we learned a lot. So it was, we developed a product, and it was a project. But we also learned a lot in the process. And you learned it because, just like we said at the beginning, you were part of the, in, the development of that. Yes. Right? It wasn't like, OK, I learned that. In step one, I learned this. In step two, I learned that. It's like, I learned this because I wanted to solve a problem, because I, I went out and found the information. And you were creative, and you got all of those components along with it. Why, does anybody know, and, and there are arguments, plus or minus. This isn't the best one, obviously. This is a very small sample of a bigger project. So how do you, what do you think of this? What's wrong with this? What needs work? What's not good enough? What's missing? What's, what's there? I'd like to know, too, because I can point out some things that I would change. I think if, if we could have read an introduction kind of in the, in the beginning of this, kind of explaining, you know, in this part here, saying, hey, we'd like you to read these and try to follow along, do the best you can, blah, blah, blah. We just handed this. And, and, and we read these, and, and I, I we, and that's so being as old as we are, <laughs> hey, no offense hey, to everybody, hey. we get it. But on a younger basis, I think a, a, an explanation paragraph or a sentence would be beneficial. Right, and and in my head too, I was supposed to be here early, and I was supposed to film the introduction part to this class earlier. So this would be, this is the first um, component of a green energy program that's part of the statewide pilot program. So it's a program that focuses on how do we generate, how do we use electricity, and what are our options in both of those areas. So a lot of people think electricity comes from that. That's where electricity comes from, the outlet, right? So that's not the case. There's a lot more of a system. There's a massive infrastructure behind that. The largest machine in the world is the American electrical grid. It's enormous. It is by far the most complicated in terms of physics and in terms of social and in terms of economic things that you could possibly imagine. It's pretty mind-blowing when you think about it. Where is it? It's all over. It's all Every those towers and everything? Yep. Yes. Yep. And we're very lucky to have it. I mean, when the power goes out, what do we do? We wait for the power to come back on. Well, we don't know what to do, right? It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. 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 Meanwhile, other Turn countries, that happens all the time. It's like, oh, the power went out again. Uh, yeah, of course it did. It's 3 o'clock. The power always goes out at 3 o'clock. Oh, no, there's no water. <laughs> right. Yeah, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the things that we can have. There's a lot of people that don't have. So we take this for granted. So making students aware of that is one of the responsibilities of this project, the Green Program. How, how do you start getting them to understand this massive, giant, enormous, complex machine without understanding circuits first? Because what you just made was a tiny little version of that massive, gigantic, enormous machine. So this would be the introduction to basic circuits, which the transfer of this would be, OK, we all did this. We all made it. I'm going to take all your batteries away, and I'm going to give you some magnets and some copper. Can you make the LEDs light up? Probably not. If I give you a solar panel, 
can you make the LEDs light up? If I gave you something else, can you make the LEDs light up? So you're transferring the knowledge that you just had to build up into something more advanced. And from there, it goes on to let's add some safety features, let's add a bunch of different things. So the bigger projects come in later, but we only have a certain amount of time to work with programs like this. Um, you said um, if I gave you magnets and some copper wire, if I gave you a solar panel, and maybe right now if you gave me magnets and copper wire, I might not be able to come up with anything right now, but if I had some background information, then perhaps I could do it. And by background information, you mean you want me to tell you how to do that? I don't want you to tell me how to do it, but You know, I, I'm kind of stuck on this thing of, you know, just let me read something. Because so much of, of what I've learned in my craft has been from reading. Frankie? Look, just like a lot of people didn't use their phones, all the information is out there. So the whole point of this process is to allow the student to now begin to think. Like if you look at all the innovators in this country or in, in generations past, all this standardized system was not set in place. So then they had to look for the information themselves. And we live in a very high tech environment, so kids don't even want to read anymore. Yeah. So they, we, we also have to adapt to the, the, the manner <clears throat> in which they communicate themselves. Well, I, I guess, yeah. Uh, it's a generational thing in some right. respects. So, I never would have thought, well, you asked the question, and I still don't think, well, it's right here. Yeah, yeah, I, I want something it. in front of me, you know, and, a page that I can read. And it's and a generational thing, it's but it's also a motivational thing. So if you ha throw a book in front of a kid and tell them, read this, their motivation is, I'm going to do this because this is what I was told to do, and I'm going to follow the instructions, and I'm a good student, and I know that if I don't do this, I'm not going to get a good grade, and if I don't get a good grade, I'm not going to get into college, and if I don't go to college, then my whole world is over. <laughs> they're good students, which is great, because they're going to be students for a little bit longer, but eventually they're not going to be a student any longer, and then what? then they're going to become part of that 20% of people that don't have a job or the 50% of students that don't graduate from college after a couple of years because they don't see the point of it because there's no reason to continue on because whatever reason. There's a lot of things that go on. If you define school, if you define a student or a person as being good at something and that something stops at a certain point, they're going to fail. If you define a person to be a good student when they're done with school, what's going to happen? Let's define them to be greater than that. So let's motivate them to want to read something. One of the best stories that I heard, we just had a, a partner of ours share this, this, this story where they walked into a classroom and people were sitting there reading. Or they, walked, they, they walked into the school, actually, and people were sitting outside reading books Nobody was there, no teachers, no nothing. The students were outside reading books. Why? These are students that never would have read a book before. There's, they would have socialized, they would have hung out, they probably would have smoked cigarettes or something else, to be honest. And they're outside reading a book because they were motivated to learn about what they were about to do in that class that day. They wanted to get the information. So they looked it up on their own, they found it out, they took the time to find it, they, they, they embraced it a lot more. So instead of saying, here, read this, and in 20 minutes from now, we're going to use it, excite them to find out what was in that thing that you were about to read. And that comes from the design piece. This took a long time to design. This was the multiple iterations of this beforehand. To give you an example, one of the best things that I think I did, number one used to say, has a switch. Number one now says, turns on and off. Do you see the big difference between that? What do you learn about a circuit if you have a switch? You learn that the switch moves. You don't learn anything about the circuit, though. Turning on and off requires creative uses of different materials. It requires you to understand what a switch does. So now when you're handed a switch, you're like, that was so much easier. Thank you for making switches. And maybe you'll think, what else can I do to make a circuit work easier? How do you think we got all the electronic circuits that we have now? Would this typically, what these guys did, would that typically be your foundation 
that you would start them with something like that to lay the groundwork for the kids that were novices? And then, and then you would branch it to something, something like what we did? This would be a very first project for ninth grade students in the Green Energy Academy. This, by the way, without was also, what these, without any prior <coughs> instruction. No prior instruction, because I would do it. I would implement it a little bit different. So they would read it. Room? They would read it. Twenty-five. And how long of a period or whatever time one, frame? Ninth grade is one hour. Okay. I'm probably gonna have longer this coming year since I'm at a new school. What I would do though differently would be spend a lot more time on this. So the second page, which you guys probably just skipped right over, but it has a lot of questions and constraints. Look at the, the requirements closely. What don't you know and what do you need to know more about? That would take a full day. So when they say, well, what do you mean it needs to turn on and off? And I would, most people would say, well, like a light switch? That's exactly what you said, right? Like a light switch. OK, but you don't have a light switch. Sorry, I'm broke. I'm cheap. We're, we don't have any. So what does the light switch do? And see, that starts bringing in these questions of, here, now we know what the switch does. We know what we need to do. We need to open and close the circuit. And that would spend a, a, a significantly longer time with ninth grade students on that part. And then I would probably go into a bit of, OK, before everybody rushes over there, because you guys are mature adults, and I, I knew that I could trust you to not make a mess and, and share, I would say, why don't you think of what you need and design it first? So you would have your LEDs, you would show how they're going to be connected, and you would show where each piece was going to go and what materials you wanted. And then you can go back and get it. Instead of having, because what happens with students, I'm sure you know, you have one group that took all this stuff, and they're like, oh, yeah, we're going to use that for something. We just haven't figured it out yet. We just don't want anybody else to use it. So. I'm not seeing, one thing I'm not seeing, how are we tying this into green technology? So what's the purpose, what piece of this would we need, what piece of this is green first? So when you make these, what piece was green? LEDs. LEDs, right? LEDs because, are significantly- Because they're drawing less electricity? Oh, but yeah, hardly anything. Like Much less power, small, okay. right? So that's gotta be presented to these students also. Right, so that would be another part of this too. What are we using electricity for? Lights are a big thing. Well, is that light the same as the light that you have in your house? Are those lights, which are LEDs? No. So they just look like it with the grating. So are those lights the same as the ones that you have in your house? What are the different types of lights? Why are there different types of lights? Which one is the most efficient? There's a lot of metrics and a lot of measuring that come into it, too. But this introduces them to the first metri or metering by making them meter. They ask that question, how do you know it's 2.4 volts? Prove it. They said, but we took two, we took two uh, um, batteries and put them together. 1.5 plus 1.5 is two. So I would take two batteries and I'd put them in parallel and I'd be like 1.5 plus 1.5 is 1.5. So they have to prove that they have all this. So they learn how to use the meter. They learn how to use these basic things. They know that they could test things at least. So you could actually throw something at them possibly with, uh, to branch off a little bit and say, okay, we're using LEDs, therefore they're much more efficient. And then if you're doing a series of, say, 10 lights, at some time you step it down to five, three, or whatever to save even more electricity, depending upon the application. Right, course. so there's conservation. And then the next, the next step would be they come in and all of their batteries are gone. What did the battery do? What's the, what does the battery source. provide? What it's the power, power source, source, right? Yeah. So you need a new power source, OK? Well, there's no batteries. What are we going to do? A lot of kids say, we'll plug it into the wall. Don't let them do that. Right? So then you start brainstorming, what are some other things that generate electricity? It's, it's, a lot of people don't know that. Many people don't know that. You know? Like, how is electricity generated? I don't know. I saw, I saw, somebody, I saw a great, uh, great documentary has somebody out there protesting against the use of coal for electricity because of climate change, right? And they're like, why, why are you out here? Like, what, what's your problem? And he goes, I just don't see why we have to use coal. Can't we just use electricity? <laughs> you're like, wait a second. <laughs> you don't know anything about why you're here, do you? So it's pretty impressive that he didn't make that connection. So water. where does it come from? How does it get to where it goes? There's a lot of that process that gets but nobody, nobody knows from that. This, the from majority of people, students or adults, have no right. idea even where your water out of your tap's coming from. Right. And what was it originally? Exactly. What was it prior to coming out of your tap? Mm -hmm. Which is pretty nasty. I know. If you're lucky. Yeah. yeah. I get out of the Delaware. I'm thinking about something, which is always dangerous for me. 
What's the biggest machine in the world? The electrical grid. Right. And Frankie, you said that in this day and age, you use the resources that are available. What does this need? You can also get a solar charger for it, too. But it needs electricity. You know, and it's not just the charger, you know, it's the towers, you know, and if you don't, if you're relying on this, but you can't use it, and it's, you know, where are you then? But they've already developed a sense of, okay, we have to do research, so then you look for other things. Like one of the things that one of our colleagues recently shared with us was kids were coming asking for books for a particular subject, so it's different than me highlighting a paragraph that you should read as opposed to you understanding the process of I have to do research. Mm -hmm. Research looks you know, different to every individual. Research for me could just be, you know, if, if I wanna perform, I might just watch a bunch of videos of the people who best perform live music and I'm looking at that. Or I could read a book. Or if somebody could spend a whole hour telling me, you know, from his perspective what that looks like, but I never see it. So it, it's going to look different. Or you could go to a live venue. Or you go to a live event. So every form of research is going to look different for every individual. What we're trying to focus on is for them to understand that they have to do research because now it becomes personal. However they, they do it. Right. They, they, they begin to own now. So the it's, choices. Experience. It's, it's, like, choice it's like teaching them how to fish. You teach them how to fish. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's what all innovators do. Everyone who innovates something finds it out. No, no one tells them, look, you know, you're going to make this and you're going to be great. I mean, we say these things, but it, it takes that, that inner desire to learn something new in order for you to make this huge difference that you know, want everyone to do. A couple of the students that designed some of their projects, some of them were actually similar to yours. You got something on your forehead that looks like a doctor's shield and another one that wraps around your, um, your waist like a belt almost that, that projects the, the LEDs out of it. A couple more. Somebody had like a wristband that focuses on it. Yeah. I know. So here's your quiz. Which of these are good PBLs? We have your first one. That is a CAD drawing of a multi-view product, some type of hinge that shows you different views with the dimensions on it. That is a website created by a student who took circuit boards and wanted to recycle them and so used a laser cutter to cut them, makes earrings, and now sells them on the internet. This is Ron's classes, electric vehicle, which I'll tell you more about shortly. And that is a manufactured um, trainer that teaches you how to install and um, uh, wind turbines and solar panels. So who has the answer? Which of these are examples of good PBL? I think they all are. It just depends on how I think they all are. I think B and C. Well, what are you doing with the drawing? Yeah, we, yeah. Do they have to create the drawing? I don't. Are I they creating the drawing or are they creating the? Uh, You're hungry, and I, you just got the answer. It's impossible. Right. To it's impossible tell. to tell. Why? Because you don't know how it was presented to them. Were they just following instructions, yeah. or were they solving an open-ended? Right. Thank you. So we did a good job explaining this morning. This could be an awesome PBL if the student was engaged and was part of it to begin with. If he just followed instructions and that's what right. they did if here, step this is step a step-by-step step step YouTube like video that, that you could take 10 minutes. If you have never used CAD before, you could do this. And you still wouldn't know how to use CAD, but you would know how to use the instructions. That's a student that took the initiative to do that. So if you go to reboot.com, you can buy some earrings for yourselves or for somebody else. Go for it. She's 16 years old and she donates all the money to all the people that, uh, women who are going into engineering, I believe. Yep. Reboot.com. If you Google Reboot, she just changed it from something. It's like, it's available on Etsy too. 